Hello friends, Simon Kane here in my show pyjamas. Uh, what I'm about to embark bark is maybe a too a grandiose term, but we're all shut in, aren't we? Uh, what the, this is this. This is Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, and I'm going to read it because, uh, well, because I'm reading it, and I have it, and it's very interesting, um, and and it's a good read. Um, it's it's actually a work of fiction, really, because Daniel Defoe was five years old uh, during the, is it called The Visitation? Whatever he calls it, in 1665, but he's writing as a not five-year-old saddler. Uh, in London at the time, so it's very well researched. He's a he's a he's a journalist, Defoe. Um, the Great Visitation, that's it. And there's a great introduction in this book as well uh, by Anthony Burgess about what an influence Defoe was on H.G. Wells. I've never read any Defoe before, but it's uh, it's a really good read, which is why I thought I'd read it all aloud so you can enjoy it as well as much as you can with me on my phone, um, which only takes about. 10 minutes of video, which is why this is all cut together. Um, like that cut I just did. Uh, so I, this, is, this will be the first 10 or so pages, page 23, which is where it begins, to uh, 35. And it will chart. It opens with uh, a quite a dry list of deaths by number. So um, it all looks like that. And then it picks up uh, as the narrator starts talking about his decisions whether or not to leave London um, so uh, yeah, enjoy A journal of the plague year being observations or memorials of the most remarkable occurrences as well as public as private which happened in London during the last great visitation in 1665 written by a citizen who continued all the while in London never made public before It was about the beginning of September 1664 that I, among the rest of my neighbours, heard in ordinary discourse that the plague was returned again in Holland, for it had been very violent there, and particularly at Amsterdam and Rotterdam in the year 1663, whither they say it was brought, some said from Italy, others from the Levant, among some goods which were brought home by their Turkey fleet. Others said it was brought from Candia, others from Cyprus. It mattered not from whence it came, but all agreed it was coming to Holland again. We had no such thing as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumours and reports of things and to improve them by the invention of men, as I have lived to see practised since. But such things as these were gathered from the letters of merchants and others who corresponded abroad, and from them was handed about by word of mouth only, so that things did not spread instantly over the whole nation, as they do now. But it seems that the government had a true account of it, and several councils were held about ways to prevent its coming over, but all was kept very private. Hence it was that this rumour died off again, and people began to forget it as a thing we were very little concerned in, and that we hoped was not true. Till the latter end of November, or the beginning of December, 1664, when two men, said to be Frenchmen, died of the plague in Longacre, or rather at the upper end of Drury Lane. The family they were in endeavoured to conceal it as much as possible, but as it had gotten some vent in the discourse of the neighbourhood, the secretaries of state got knowledge of it, and concerning themselves to inquire about it in order to be certain of the truth, Two physicians and a surgeon were ordered to go to the house and make inspection. This they did. And finding evident tokens of the sickness upon both the bodies that were dead, they gave their opinions publicly that they died of the plague. Whereupon it was given in to the parish clerk, and he also returned them to the hall, and it was printed in the weekly bill of mortality in the usual manner, thus, Plague, two, parishes infected, one. The people showed a great concern at this and began to be alarmed all over the town and the more because on the last week in December 1664 another man died in the same house and of the same distemper. And then we were easy again for about six weeks when none having died with any marks of infection it was said that the distemper was gone. But after that I think it was about the 12th of February another died in another house but in the same parish and in the same manner. This turned the people's eyes pretty much towards that end of the town. And the weekly bill showing an increase of burials in St Giles Parish more than usual, it began to be suspected that the plague was among the people at that end of the town, and that many had died of it, though they had taken care to keep it as much from the knowledge of the public as possible. This possessed the heads of the people very much, and few cared to go through Drury Lane or the other streets suspected unless they had extraordinary business that obliged them to it. This increase of the bill stood thus. The usual number of burials in a week in the parishes of St Giles in the Fields and St Andrews Holborn were from 12 to 17 or 19 each, few more or less. 
But from the time that the plague first began in St Giles Parish, it was observed that the ordinary burials increased in number considerably. Uh, for example, from December the 27th to January 3rd, St Giles 16, St Andrews 17. From January the 3rd to the 10th, St Giles 12, St Andrews 25. January the 10th to 17th, St Giles 18, St Andrews 18. January the 17th and 24th, St Giles 23, St Andrews 16 having been 12 to 17 or 19 each. January the 24th to 31st, St Giles 24, St Andrews 15. January the 30th to February the 7th, St Giles 21, St Andrews 23. February the 7th to the 14th, St Giles 24, where of one of the plague. The like increase of the bills was observed in the parishes of St Brides, adjoining on one side of Holborn Parish, and in the parish of St James Clerkenwell, adjoining on the other side of Holborn, in both which parishes the usual numbers that died weekly were from four to six or eight, whereas at that time they were increased as follows, from December the 20th to December the 27th, St Bride's zero, St James eight, December the 27th to January the 3rd, St Bride's six, St James nine, January the 3rd to the 10th, St Bride's eleven, St James seven, January the 10th to the 17th, St Bride's twelve, St James nine, January the 17th to 24th, St Bride's 9, St James 15. January the 24th to the 31st, St Bride's 8, St James 12. January the 31st to February the 7th, St Bride's 13, St James 5. February, February the 7th to the 14th, St Bride's 12, St James 6. Besides this, it was observed with great uneasiness by the people that the weekly bills in general increased very much during these weeks, although it was at a time of the year when usually the bills were very moderate. The usual number of burials within the bills of mortality for a week was from about 240 to 300. The last bill was esteemed a pretty high bill, but after this we found the bill successively increasing as follows. December the 20th to the 27th, buried... 291 increased. From the 27th to the 3rd of January, buried 349, increased 58. January the 3rd to the 10th, buried 394, increased 45. January the 10th to the 17th, buried 415, increased 21. January the 17th to 24th, buried 474, increased 59. This last bill was really frightful being a higher number than had been known to have been buried in one week since the preceding visitation of 1656. However, all this went off again, and the weather growing cold and the frost, which began in December, still continuing very severe even till the end of February, attended with sharp though moderate winds, the bills decreased again, and the city grew healthy, and everybody began to look upon the danger as good as over, only that still the burials of St Giles continued high, from the beginning of April especially, they stood at 25 each week, till the week from the 18th to the 25th, when there was buried in St Giles Parish 30, whereof two of the plague and eight of the spotted fever, which was looked upon as the same thing. Likewise, the number that died of the spotted fever in the whole increased, being eight the week before, and twelve the week above named. This alarmed us all again, and terrible apprehensions were among the people, especially the weather being now changed and growing warm, and the summer being at hand. However, the next week there seemed to be some hopes again. The bills were low, the number of the dead in all was but 388, there was none of the plague, and but four of the spotted fever. But the following week it returned again, and the distemper was spread into two or three other parishes, viz. St Andrews, Holborn, St Clement Danes, and to the great affliction of the city, one died within the city walls in the parish of St Mary Woolchurch, that is to say, in Bearbinder Lane, near Stocks Market. In all there were nine of the plague and six of the spotted fever. It was, however, upon inquiry found that this Frenchman who died in Bearbinder Lane was one who, having lived in Long Acre near the infected houses, had removed for fear of the distemper, not knowing that he was already infected. This was the beginning of May, yet the weather was temperate, variable and cool enough, and people had still some hopes. That which encouraged them was that the city was healthy. The whole 97 parishes buried but 54 we began to hope that, as it was chiefly among the people at that end of the town, it might go no farther, and the rather because the next week, which was from the 9th of May to the 16th, there died but three, of which not one within the whole city or liberties, and St Andrew's buried but 15, which was very low. 
Tis true St Giles buried two and thirty, but still, as there was but one of the plague, people began to be easy. The whole bill was also very low, for the week before the bill was but 347, and the week above mentioned but 343. We continued in these hopes for a few days, but it was but for a few, for the people were no more to be deceived thus. They searched the houses and found that the plague was really spread every way, and that many died of it every day. So that now all our extenuations abated, and it was no more to be concealed, nay, it quickly appeared that the infection had spread itself beyond all hopes of abatement. Then in the parish of St. Giles it was gotten into several streets, and several families lay all sick together, and accordingly in the weekly bill for the next week the thing began to show itself. There was indeed but fourteen set down of the plague, but this was all knavery and collusion. For in St. Giles' parish they buried forty in all, whereof it was certain most of them died of the plague, though they were set down of other distempers, and though the number of all the burials was not increased above thirty-two, and the whole bill being but three hundred and eighty-five, yet there were fourteen of the spotted fever, as well as fourteen of the plague, and we took it for granted upon the whole that there were fifty died that week of the plague. The next bill was from the 23rd of May to the 30th, when the number of the plague was seventeen. But the burials in St. Giles were fifty-three, a frightful number, of whom they set down but nine of the plague. But on an examination more strictly by the Justices of Peace and at the Lord Mayor's request, it was found that there were twenty more who were really dead of the plague in that parish, but had been set down of the spotted fever or other distempers, besides others concealed. But those are trifling things to what followed immediately after. For now the weather set in hot and from the first week in June the infection spread in a dreadful manner, and the bills rose high. The articles of the fever, spotted fever, and teeth began to swell, for all that could conceal their distempers did it to prevent their neighbours shunning and refusing to converse with them, and also to prevent authority shutting up their houses, which, though it was not yet practised, yet was threatened, and people were extremely terrified at the thoughts of it. The second week in June, the parish of St Giles, where still the weight of the infection lay, buried 120, whereof, though the bills said but 68 of the plague, everybody said there had been 100, at least, calculating it from the usual number of funerals in that parish, as above. Till this week, the city continued free, there having never any died except that one Frenchman whom I mentioned before. Within the whole 97 parishes... <coughs> excuse me, within the whole 97 parishes... Now there died four within the city walls, one in Wood Street, one in Fenchurch Street, and two in Crooked Lane. Southwark was entirely free, having not one yet died on that side of the water. I lived without Aldgate, about midway between Aldgate Church and Whitechapel Bars, on the left-hand or north side of the street. And as the distemper had not reached to that side of the city, our neighbourhood continued very easy. But at the other end of the town, their consternation was very great and the richer sort of people, especially the nobility and gentry from the west part of the city, thronged out of town with their families and servants in an unusual manner. And this was more particularly seen in Whitechapel, that is to say the broad street where I lived. Indeed, nothing was to be seen but wagons and carts, with goods, women, servants, children, etc. Coaches filled with people of the better sort, and horsemen attending them, and all hurrying away. Then empty wagons and carts appeared, and spare horses with servants who it was apparent were returning or sent from the countries to fetch more people, besides innumerable numbers of men on horseback, some alone, others with servants, and, generally speaking, all loaded with baggage and fitted out for travelling, as anyone might perceive by their appearance. This was a very terrible and melancholy thing to see, and as it was a sight which I could not but look on from morning to night, for indeed there was nothing else of moment to be seen, it filled me with very serious thoughts of the misery that was coming upon the city and the unhappy condition of those that would be left in it. This hurry of the people was such for some weeks that there was no getting at the Lord Mayor's door without exceeding difficulty. There was such pressing and crowding there to get passes and certificates of health for such as travelled abroad, for without these there was no being admitted to pass through the towns upon the road or to lodge in any inn. Now, as there had none died in the city for all this time, the city walls, my Lord Mayor gave certificates of health without any difficulty to all those who lived in the ninety-seven parishes and to those in the liberties too for a while. This hurry, I say, continued some weeks, that is to say all the month of May and June, and the more because it was rumoured that an order of the government was to be issued out to place turnpikes and barriers on the road to prevent people travelling, and that the towns on the road would not suffer people from London to pass for fear of bringing the infection along with them, though neither of these rumours had any foundation but in the imagination, especially at first. 
I now began to consider seriously with myself concerning my own case and how I shall dispose of myself, that is to say, whether I should resolve to stay in London or shut up my house and flee as many of my neighbours did. I have set this particular down so fully because I know not but it may be of moment to those who come after me, if they come to be brought in the same distress and to the same manner of making their choice. And therefore I desire this account may pass with them rather for a direction to themselves to act by than a history of my acting, seeing it may not be of one farthing value to them to know what became of me. I had two important things before me. The one was the carrying on my business and shop, which was considerable, and which was embarked all my effects in the world, and the other was the preservation of my life in so dismal a calamity as I saw apparently was coming upon the whole city, and which, however great it was, my fears perhaps, as well as other people's, represented to be much greater than it could be. The first consideration was a great moment to me. My trade was a saddler, and as my dealings were chiefly not by a shop or chance trade, but among the merchants trading to the English colonies in America, so my effects lay very much in the hands of such. I was a single man, tis true, but I had a family of servants whom I kept at my business, had a house, shop, and warehouses filled with goods, and in short to leave them all as things in such a case must be left, that is to say, without any overseer or person fit to be trusted with them, had been to hazard the loss not only of my trade, but of my goods, and, indeed, of all I had in the world. I had an elder brother at the same time in London, and not many years before come over from Portugal, and advising with him, his answer was, in three words, the same that was given in another case, quite different, viz, Master, save thyself. In a word, he was for my retiring into the country, as he resolved to do himself with his own family, telling me what he had, it seems, heard abroad, that the best preparation for the plague was to run away from it. As to my argument of losing my trade, my goods, or debts, he quite confuted me. He told me the same thing which I had argued for my staying, viz., that I would trust God with my safety and health, was the strongest repulse to my pretensions of losing my trade and my goods. For, says he, is it not as reasonable that you should trust God with the chance or risk of losing your trade, as that you should stay in so eminent a point of danger and trust him with your life? I could not argue that I was in any strait as to a place where to go, having several friends and relations in Northamptonshire, whence our family first came from, and particularly I had an only sister in Lincolnshire, very willing to receive and entertain me. My brother, who had already sent his wife and two children into Bedfordshire and resolved to follow them, pressed my going very earnestly, and I had once resolved to comply with his desires, but at that time could get no horse. For though it is true all the people did not go out of the city of London, yet I may venture to say that in a manner all the horses did, for there was hardly a horse to be bought or hired in the whole city for some weeks. Once I resolved to travel on foot with one servant, and as many did lie at no inn but carry a soldier's tent with us, and so lie in the fields, the weather being very warm and no danger from taking cold, I say as many did, because several did so at last, especially those who had been in the armies in the war, which had not been many years past, and I must needs say that, speaking of second causes, had most of the people that travelled done so, the plague had not been carried into so many country towns and houses as it was, to the great damage, and indeed to the ruin, of abundance of people. But then my servant, whom I had intended to take down with me, deceived me, and being frightened at the increase of the distemper, and not knowing when I should go, he took other measures and left me, so I was put off for that time, and one way or other, I always found that to appoint to go away was always crossed by some accident or other as to disappoint and put it off again, and this brings in a story which otherwise might be thought a, a needless digression, viz. about these disappointments being from heaven. I mention this story also as the best method I can advise any person to take in such a case, especially if he be one that makes conscience of his duty and would be directed what to do in it namely that he should keep his eye upon the particular providences which occur at that time and look upon them complexly as they regard one another and as all together regard the question before him and then I think he may safely take them for intimations from heaven of what is his unquestioned duty to do in such a case I mean as to going away from or staying in the place where we dwell when visited with an infectious distemper it came very warmly into my mind one morning, as I was musing on this particular thing, that as nothing attended us without the direction or permission of divine power, so these disappointments must have something in them extraordinary, and I ought to consider whether it did not evidently point out or intimate to me that it was the will of heaven I should not go. It immediately followed in my thoughts that if it really was from God that I should stay, 
he was able effectually to preserve me in the midst of all the death and danger that would surround me, and that if I attempted to secure myself by fleeing from my habitation and acted contrary to these intimations, which I believe to be divine, it was a kind of flying from God, and that he could cause his justice to overtake me when and where he thought fit. These thoughts quite turned my resolutions again, and when I came to discourse with my brother again, I told him that I am inclined to stay and take my lot in that station which God had placed me, and that it seemed to me to be more especially my duty on the account of what I have said. My brother, though a very religious man himself, laughed at all I had suggested about its being an intimation from heaven, and told me several stories of such foolhardy people, as he called them, as I was, that I ought indeed to submit to it as a work of heaven, if I had been in any way disabled by distempers or diseases, and that then not being able to go, I ought to acquiesce in the direction of him who, having been my maker, had an undisputed right of sovereignty in disposing of me, and that then there had been no difficulty to determine which was the call of his providence and which was not, but that I should take it as an intimation from heaven that I should not go out of town only because I could not hire a horse to go, or my fellow was run away that was to attend me, was ridiculous, since at the time I had my health and limbs and other servants, and might with ease travel a day or two on foot, and having a good certificate of being in perfect health, might either hire a horse or take a post on the road, as I thought fit. And then he proceeded to tell me of the mischievous consequences which attended the presumption of the Turks and Mohammedans in Asia, and in other places where he had been, for my brother being a merchant was a very few years before, as I have already observed, returned from abroad, coming last from Lisbon and how, presuming upon their professed predestinating notions, and of every man's end being predetermined and unalterably beforehand decreed, they would go unconcerned into infected places and converse with infected persons, by which means they died at the rate of ten or fifteen thousand a week, whereas the Europeans, or Christian merchants, who kept themselves retired and reserved, generally escaped the contagion. Upon these arguments my brother changed my resolutions again, and I began to resolve to go and accordingly made all things ready. For in short, the infection increased round me, and the bills had risen to almost 700 a week. And my brother told me he would venture to stay no longer. I desired him to let me consider of it, but till the next day, and I would resolve, and as I had already prepared everything as well as I could as to my business, and whom to entrust my affairs with, I had little to do but to resolve. I went home that evening greatly oppressed in my mind, irresolute, and not knowing what to do. I set the evening wholly apart to consider seriously about it, and was all alone, for already people had, as it were by general consent, taken up the custom of not going out of the doors after sunset, the reasons I shall have occasion to say more of by and by. In the retirement of this evening I endeavoured to resolve first what was my duty to do, and I stated the arguments with which my brother had pressed me to go into the country, and I set against them the strong impressions which I had on my mind for staying, the visible call I seemed to have from the particular circumstances of my calling and the care due from me for the preservation of my effects, which were, as I might say, my estate. Also the intimations which I thought I had from heaven, that to me signified a kind of direction to venture, and it occurred to me that if I had what I might call a direction to stay, I ought to suppose it contained a promise of being preserved if I obeyed. This lay close to me, and my mind seemed more and more encouraged to stay than ever, and supported with a secret satisfaction that I should be kept. Add to this, that, turning over the Bible which lay before me, and while my thoughts were more than ordinarily serious upon the question, I cried out, Well, I know not what to do, Lord, direct me, and the like. And at that juncture I happened to stop turning over the book at the 91st Psalm, and casting my eye on the second verse, I read on to the seventh verse, exclusive, And after that included the tenth, as follows. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Etc. 
I scarce need tell the reader that from that moment I resolved that I would stay in the town, and casting myself entirely upon the goodness and protection of the Almighty, would not seek any other shelter whatever, and that as my times were in his hands, he was as able to keep me in a time of the infection as in a time of health, and if he did not think it fit to deliver me, still I was in his hands, and it was meet he should do with me, as should seem good to him. With this resolution I went to bed, and I was further confirmed in it the next day by the woman being taken ill with whom I had intended to entrust my house and all my affairs. But I had a further obligation laid on me on the same side, for the next day I found myself very much out of order also, so that if I would have gone away, I could not. And that's where I'll stop. There are no chapters in this, so uh, you just keep reading on and on. That was about 12 pages. It took about half an hour. But yes, we're going to stop with the narrator being taken ill. And uh, there'll be more tomorrow. I might not wear pyjamas. I hope you are very well. Uh, if you're not, I hope you recover soon. Uh, thank you very much for listening. All the best. Bye-bye.